welcome to another episode of Access Ability. It's a show on YouTube where I talk about the video game industry, accessibility, and representation. Basically, how can we help more people to play games, and more people to see themselves in the games they play? I'm your host, Laura. I'm a white woman with bright blue hair, shaved on one side, wearing a plain black dress. By the time this video goes live, it is probably going to be the start of 2022, and I'm a human, we love patterns, I'm autistic, I really love patterns, therefore I see this milestone and my brain goes, let's look at the year that has just been, so we're gonna look back over 2021 in terms of accessibility. 2021 has been a weird year in general for the video game industry because the big year indoors has had a bit of a knock-on effect for game development, from indie teams all the way up to AAA studios. People not being able to go to the physical location where they're used to going to to make the games has made it hard to make games, and a result of that is that in a lot of areas of the video game industry, games that have managed to come out in 2021 have been games that follow a template set out in years prior. I think that that's true for video game mechanics, I think it's true for us seeing more sequels than original titles this year, but I also think that it's true in terms of where accessibility is compared to last year. I don't think that is the sole cause for this year being the way it is with accessibility, but I sure feel like it's a factor. So today, on Accessibility, we're going to be taking a look at the state of video game accessibility in 2021. We're going to take a look at some of the new steps forwards that some developers have taken to move accessibility to a better state. We're going to take a look at some of the things that, for better or worse, have stayed unchanged. And we're going to take a look at some of the things that have been failings that need to change going forward into 2022. For the purposes of today's video, I'm going to be focusing on several video game development companies from the perspective of their accessibility support. Some of these studios, such as Insomniac Games, Ubisoft, and Electronic Arts, have credible allegations of many kinds levied against them as companies. While I would advise reading up on these allegations, I won't be going in depth on them in this video, as I believe accessible video games are still few and far enough between to make note of those that are succeeding in this regard. In a world where so very few video games are truly accessible, I think it's important that disabled players are informed of which games may be playable by them, even in cases where I wouldn't personally want to support the companies involved financially. I'll talk about the various allegations in the comments below, so as to not take up additional time in this video, but if you want to know more, go listen to Podquisition, it's a video game podcast I do where I talk a lot about this stuff. Looking back at the state of video game accessibility in 2021, for better and for worse, the overall story is very similar to what we saw at the end of 2020, in terms of which companies were generally doing well and which were falling behind the pack. If you put aside the topic of consistency, Sony's first-party studios, particularly Insomniac Games this year, are still top of the mountain when it comes to offering a wide range of flashy accessibility options in their AAA games, and doing so at a high level of quality, with some inconsistency. Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart is the best example to look at from Sony this year in terms of gauging where their titles are when at their best. The game offers things like D-pad shortcuts, aim assist, lock-on, and even simplified controls that can map most of the game's core features down to a single button used in different ways. While accessibility settings are not yet standardised and mandatory across first-party studios, most Sony first-party games releasing today are following in the footsteps of The Last of Us 2, in terms of support for high-quality subtitles, customizable difficulty, gameplay assist features, and most notably, High Contrast Mode, a feature which Sony still seems to own the market on. No other AAA game development studio has yet attempted to implement a feature like High Contrast Mode across their games, which is a real shame. But the feature is starting to crop up in games from indie teams, games such as Boomerang X, a first-person ninja game which implemented similar options this year. While Microsoft's steps forward in accessibility this year have not been as flashy as those taken by Sony, I would argue Microsoft this year has made steps that, long term, are going to be more important for the growth and stability of accessibility support in the games industry. Back in October, Microsoft implemented a series of new tools and features 
designed to help and encourage game developers to make their games more accessible, and to hold gaming accessibility to a set of measurable standards. The first and most public facing of which was the implementation of accessibility tags on the Xbox Store. At the feature's launch, Microsoft created a list of 20 tags for common accessibility features that are important to disabled gamers, across gameplay, audio, visual, and input categories. These include things like narrated menus, full keyboard support, subtitle options, input remapping, single stick gameplay, no button holds, speech to text and text to speech communication with online players, and more. Developers can select these options if featured in their game and have their presence listed on the Xbox Store so that players can pick up those games with confidence they'll be able to play them, without having to first do external research. Additionally, developers can choose to link to an external website from within the store page with more accessibility information not covered by these common tags. In order to have these tags listed on a game on the storefront, there are apparently Microsoft certification requirements in place to ensure that the included feature meets a certain level of quality. One example given is that to receive the input remapping tag, a game can't simply allow for basic button remapping, but has to go as far as including X and Y axis remapping on the control sticks, for example. Now, to be clear, Sony has also this year implemented an accessibility-focused page on the PlayStation Store on PS5, but the difference here is the standardization of and criteria for getting accessibility tags. On Xbox, a game must meet a set quality bar in execution of accessibility to receive a specific accessibility tag. While these tags are not mandatory for developers, Microsoft is creating a quality bar threshold that developers need to meet in order to be promoted as accessible by Microsoft. This is a push to encourage developers not just to have accessibility features in their games, but to have those features meet a quality threshold before they are praised. By comparison, an example of Sony's inconsistency of execution, and the kind of thing that Microsoft seems to be trying to do away with with these sort of consistency requirements, would be that where The Last of Us 2, for example, allowed players to turn high contrast mode on and off at will during gameplay with a swipe of the touchpad, and supported high contrast mode during all cutscenes, Ratchet & Clank this year only allows high contrast mode to be turned on or off by pausing the game and going a few menu levels deep, and doesn't support it at all during some cutscenes. As we will see during today's video, more and more video games today technically feature accessibility options and settings, but the quality level they reach is an area the industry is yet to make consistent. Microsoft this year also added a system level set of colorblindness filters to help accommodate somewhat for games with no custom colorblindness support of their own, as well as encouraging more developers to use Xbox's accessibility testing service, or they'll be told if their game meets Xbox's internal accessibility standards, and if not, how they can get there, as well as being pointed towards a new online course designed to teach and test knowledge of accessibility standards and support options. Microsoft published games such as Psychonauts 2, Halo Infinite, and Forza Horizon 5 all featured consistent, robust accessibility support. This support was more consistent in execution than that offered by Sony Studios, but does still lack some features such as high contrast mode support. Microsoft's games have, in particular, offered good options for text-to-speech support in menus, as well as interesting custom difficulty support options. Microsoft is also still the only console manufacturer to support an official accessibility controller, as well as supporting legacy controllers from the last console generation for use in modern titles. The only real disappointment regarding Microsoft is the fact that Forza Horizon 5, which released at the start of November, was heavily promoted at launch with the promise of sign language interpreter support. This feature, which only supports American Sign Language and British Sign Language, and only during cutscenes, is still not in the game more than six weeks post-release. I'm glad they're trying to move the industry forward, but this feature is limited in execution, and not having it in-game six weeks post-release after making a big deal of its inclusion isn't great. Of the big three console manufacturers, Nintendo is still majorly lagging behind on accessibility support across their first-party games. A prime example of this is Metroid Dread, 
a game that launched with basically zero accessibility settings options at all. The game is highly difficult, with control inputs often requiring combinations of multiple awkward buttons, as well as a reliance on very fast reaction quick time button presses, and not even the most basic of options to switch between control presets. The only positive accessibility aspect of the game is the inclusion of a map that highlights types of progression blockers, and allows you to see when you unlock a new type of item or upgrade, which paths have now opened up, something that I do want to see more Metroidvania style games do. The one area where Nintendo made a positive step forward this year was with the release of Skyward Sword HD, which took a game which previously only supported motion controls, and added a non-motion controlled option for play. This was clearly done to support the Switch Lite and handheld play rather than for accessibility reasons, but it does show that, when forced, Nintendo can find creative non-motion alternatives to motion controls in even their most motion-focused titles. In the year ahead, I am going to be critical of any Nintendo game where motion controls are mandatory for play. Nintendo can work out alternatives when they try, and we should hold them to that standard. While the Switch doesn't feature an official accessibility controller, I did get my hands on and try out the Hori Flex this year, a third-party Switch accessibility controller. While it functionally does the trick, it's triple the price of Microsoft's official solution, features much smaller built-in face buttons, is only available right now in Japan, and doesn't feature any solution for emulating motion control with alternate inputs. You're honestly better off purchasing an Xbox accessibility controller and running it on Switch using something like the Titan 2 USB adapter. Lastly, Pokemon Unite released this year on Switch, and despite being a fun game conceptually, the game's monetization system was incredibly predatory, which is a real shame. Moving away from the console manufacturers, Ubisoft this year continues to excel in terms of their accessibility offerings. While they are not as flashy in their offerings as Sony, many of the options they offer in their titles are more functionally useful. I will address down in the comments some of the allegations against the company and their treatment of their staff, but if you want to learn about that from those impacted, go and follow A Better Ubisoft on Twitter. So, with that caveat said, let's talk about Far Cry 6 and what it shows us about Ubisoft's progress on the accessibility front. Far Cry 6 allows any button to be held, pressed, or double tapped, and for each of those to be mapped to a control input. So one button can be three different actions if you need fewer buttons to press, which is a really neat way of reducing the number of buttons a player needs to reach during gameplay. The game also supports a preset control scheme where no button stick presses are needed during gameplay. Far Cry 6 will also point out in-game audio, such as gunfire and explosions, point to which direction they're coming from, and give a distance measurement to tell the player how close the noise was to them. This helps deaf and hard of hearing players to navigate the world effectively, and react to threats they may not be looking at, telegraphed by audio, a step that no other major studio has yet taken. More games should really try to implement this support. Much like with Sony, I point at high contrast mode and say this is the feature that you have that everyone should be doing, this is Ubisoft's feature that I wish more game developers would pick up on. Both Sony and Ubisoft's 2021 in terms of accessibility were largely defined by taking accessibility features they'd implemented in the past, and implementing them in many of their new games. It's not consistent in its execution, but it's at least moving towards consistency of supported settings, which is progress. Both studios are largely getting the basics correct, it's more inconsistency with the things that are unique to them most often. Electronic Arts was most notable this year, in terms of accessibility, for releasing five of their accessibility patents and making them completely free for other developers to make use of, most notably the patent for the Apex Legends ping system, which allows players to highlight objectives, items, enemy players, or teammates without using voice chat. Squad members will be informed via both on-screen text and auto-generated audio, so without saying a word your squad knows what you need or what you're trying to bring to their attention. However, EA is still one of the most predatory companies within the games industry when it comes to excessive monetization in their games. While FIFA implemented the ability to see the contents of an Ultimate Team pack once per day before purchasing it, the game still visibly pushes players towards that mode and does so 
knowing full well that it's designed to push young people and disabled players towards overspending. Looking at Square Enix, we've got a largely positive feature this year with a few exceptions. The Guardians of the Galaxy video game features closed captions, overheard subtitles, decent subtitle size options, as well as options for altered letter spacing, bold text, and custom background opacity. You can also preview changes to how subtitles will appear in-game while still in the game's menu, which is great to see. That shouldn't be a surprise, but so few games do this still. The game also offered an approach to difficulty that I always enjoy and want to praise, where you can pick a difficulty preset, then get taken to a menu that shows you what that preset actually means, and allows you to further tweak aspects of it such as enemy damage and player health from the defaults of the preset. Life is Strange True Colours featured generally well-handled subtitles, including the option to swap to a dyslexia-friendly alternative font. However, the game multiple times features licensed music tracks that it does not subtitle in the slightest. It's not great that when a deaf player reaches a scene where the main character is singing a cover of a licensed song for several minutes, hearing players can hear the song being sung, but deaf players are not even told in subtitle what the name of the song is, let alone the lyrics being sung or a description of the tone of the scene. Life is Strange did include a settings option where the game would warn players before spikes in brightness or volume. The setting wasn't implemented amazingly, it often broke up the flow of the narrative by pausing the action and requiring player input to progress at dramatic moments, but the concept was promising in theory. As an autistic gamer, I often struggle with spikes in sensory intensity, but I would have appreciated an option to just normalise volume and brightness to maintain narrative flow while achieving a similar end result. Guardians of the Galaxy, as well as House of Ashes from Supermassive Games, both this year featured the option to turn button mashing sequences to buttonholes, a feature that is slowly becoming more common but should really be a standard by now. As with previous years, Japanese game development studios are largely falling behind the pack on accessibility. We previously mentioned Nintendo, but Capcom also joins them on the naughty step, with many of their games failing to even offer basics such as robust subtitles or controller remapping. The one weird exception this year was Monster Hunter Rise, a Nintendo and Capcom crossover game that featured pretty decent accessibility options against the odds. From here on out, I'm largely going to be doing a quick lightning round, talking about individual games that did things particularly well or poorly this year. Chicory included a misophonia mode toggle, which turned off the game's wet sounds. Misophonia is a condition where certain sounds can cause a person to feel irrational anger, and as the game's signature paintbrush mechanic uses paint splatting noises that are a common misophonia trigger, the game lets you turn those sounds off entirely, which is great. Boyfriend Dungeon allowed players to turn off in-game text messages from their in-game mother, for those players with trauma around their real-world mothers, something asked for by players of games like Animal Crossing and Chicory. The game also features content warnings at the start of the game. Doki Doki Literature Club Plus made a big deal before launch about the addition of content warnings to the deluxe port, comparing its content warnings to those in last year's wonderful indie title Ickenfell. However, ultimately, Doki Doki Literature Club Plus failed to live up to that comparison, featuring incredibly shallow and inconsistently applied content warnings. Unlike Ickenfell, which allowed players to skip certain scenes and gave detailed, in-depth contextual content warnings, which were hard to accidentally skip past, Doki Doki usually relied on single-word text boxes easy to accidentally skip, with no context or insufficient detail. Loop Hero, like many indie games before it, features options to turn off stylized options such as a CRT filter and custom pixel text fonts. Disco Elysium Final Cut added voice acting support to a very text-heavy game. While not all text is voiced, only dialogue, it reduces the amount of reading needed to be done by the player, which is a big step in the right direction. The addition of a narrator for the non-dialogue text would have been nice, but it's still a step forward. Looking back over 2021 as a whole, I think the biggest difference compared to, say, 2020 is that this was not a year defined by big, headline-grabbing new kinds of accessibility features. This was a year defined by companies that have already worked out that accessibility is important, trying to make the things they already know how to do more consistent as a part of this industry. 
It was a year of studios that already know that this is important, taking baby steps towards making it a standard, while the studios that historically haven't cared about accessibility features just sort of dug their heels in and spent another year not caring about even the basics. In many ways, it's kind of nice that things that were a big, huge deal in 2020 in terms of accessibility, in 2021 have become, in some cases, so commonplace that they haven't demanded their own video on this channel. It's nice that things that were exciting, that were new, that were basically unheard of a couple of years, don't even make headlines this year because they are becoming much closer to being standards. This year, in many cases, it was more notable if a game it didn't have some of the basics in place than if it did have them across the board, and that's a really great sign of progress. Developers, you don't have to reinvent the accessibility wheel every time you make a new game. Other developers have made great wheels, just look at their great wheel and go, yeah, we'll do that with our wheels. You don't have to reinvent the wheel because we know most of the things that are going to get a lot of disabled players much closer to being able to play games. Just look at best practices and start doing them consistently. Accessibility in the video game industry isn't always about flashy, extravagant headlines. What most disabled gamers need is a predictable baseline level of accessibility. We know what works, we know what helps a lot of disabled gamers, we just need to up the quality of it when we put it in games, and the number of games that have those features. We need to make it so that people who rely on a baseline level of accessibility can reliably buy your games, and know that they'll be able to play them. This year has very much continued the trend that started toward the tail end of last year of mainstream outlets starting to talk about accessibility, even outside of their accessibility-focused content, like including it in main reviews. We've seen awards shows continue to have categories for accessibility. Accessibility is becoming mainstream, and that mainstreamification is pushing a lot of developers to meet a basic threshold, and that is a great direction to see. I really did wonder last year whether this was going to be a flash in the pan of mainstream interest in accessibility, and thankfully, it has continued, and that is amazing to see. At this point, the conversation around accessibility in games has largely shifted from where it was a year ago. It's now largely about the few remaining holdouts that refuse to get on board with even the most basic of best practices, and it's about making sure that the companies that are trying to do accessibility right do so to a high level of quality and consistency. This is why, in particular, Microsoft has been so fascinating to me this year, and why I'm so excited about the direction they are pushing. With the implementation of accessibility tags on their storefront, they require a set level of quality. You can't just have subtitles, you have to have good subtitles. You can't just have colorblind support, you need to have good colorblind support. That's the kind of steps we need, because developers know how to make their games accessible in terms of, we should have this feature, but Microsoft is setting a quality bar, it's giving free courses to teach developers how to reach that quality bar, and it's offering testing so that games can be looked through and they can go, hey, your game isn't meeting the quality bar, here is how you can get it there. Microsoft is really committing, even outside of itself, to third-party partners to try and help make sure that accessibility is not only consistent, but of a high quality. And ultimately, I think that's what we need in this industry, because right now, I look at 2022. I don't think that 2022 is going to be defined by big, exciting new accessibility support. I think it's going to be defined by which companies become consistent with a high level of quality at doing this stuff, and which companies, for another year, fail to get on board.